Okay, so if everybody is ready, maybe we can start. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's start in uh, 10 seconds. Good. I don't have time, no time. <laughs> <laughs> You're fine. Alexandre has no time too, huh? <laughs> Okay, hello everybody. Um, my name is Alexandre Michy. I'm a cardiologist in Montluçon, France. I have the utmost pleasure uh, to uh, present to you uh, this uh, webinar uh, on behalf of the Telecardiology Working Group of the International Society of Telemedicine and eHealth. Uh, the ISFTH is an international society which counts more than 40,000 members. And we at the Cardiology Working Group are having uh, regular webinars on all topics uh, of cardiology. I have the extreme pleasure uh, tonight to have um, a very important guests, uh, which will present to us the ESC guidelines on valvular heart disease. I'd like to welcome Professor Alec Vahanian, Professor Bogdan Popescu, and Professor Stefan Baldus. And without delaying further our webinar, I will give the word to Professor Vahanian uh, to um, uh, tell us a few words about um, uh, uh, our gui guidelines. Okay, thank you, Alexandro, dear colleagues. I must uh, say that I slightly disagree with Alexandro. You, the audience, are the most important people here. And we'll do our best to present uh, the guidelines, uh, our views on these guidelines, because our common aim is to implement this uh, document into your practice. That's not a, an easy job, and we have to, to explain things. You have to interact with us. So I won't be any longer, and uh, I would like to introduce uh, my friend, Professor Popescu, who is from Romania, as you know, and he is uh, going to tell us about a very important point that is to say, how to manage the asymptomatic patients. So, Bogdan. Thank you very much, Alec. Thank you, Alexandru. It's a pleasure to be here. I hope this will be some useful stuff for your practice. Mm -hmm. So I will try in the next uh, 15 minutes or so mm -hmm. to talk a little bit about the challenges that an asymptomatic patient with aortic stenosis brings to us. These are my disclosures. So the guidelines clearly highlight the importance of a patient-centered assessment. And this has a few features. Important to have a proper center, a center of excellence for this uh, field, for valve disease, a heart valve clinic. And then you need a certain infrastructure and you need a thorough assessment, which should always start with a careful clinical evaluation, including most of the time biomarkers, stress testing, to confirm the asymptomatic status of the patients. You need a very good imaging service to assess these patients and to integrate the information. And you need, by doing this assessment, to confirm the severity of the valve disease, the etiology, the mechanisms of it. And of course, uh, you need to look at the patient and in terms of life expectancy, in terms of comorbidities, and by integrating this whole approach to make the proper decision for the patient management. So of course, uh, you will start by looking uh, uh, at the patient and having a good history and a good physical exam. Uh, and once you did this, uh, you will move then to uh, uh, the uh, quantification of aortic valve disease um, and the guidelines highlight again the importance of ascertaining the severity of aortic stenosis. So we need to make sure that the lesion is severe. And we know we have ECHO guidelines. ECHO is the first line tool in doing that. <coughs> we basically uh, measure by Doppler echocardiography <coughs> the velocity and gradient across the valve. And if these are high, if you have a velocity above four, a mean gradient above 40, 
then usually you have severe AS. The only caveat is to exclude a high flow status. <coughs> but other than that, you have severe AS. In the case of patients who have a low gradient AS, you need to calculate the area. <clears throat> and if the area is above one, then you exclude severe AS. You basically have non-critical AS. If the area is below one, <clears throat> then first of all, you need to check and exclude measurement errors. To check blood pressure, if this is high, you need to <clears throat> try and, and redo the echo and normal blood pressure values. And once you did that, you need to define the flow status. And if you have a normal flow <clears throat> in these conditions, then severe AS is unlikely. But if you have a low flow, then it depends on the ejection fraction. If the ejection fraction is normal, usually we use an integrated approach where CT has an important role to assess a a aortic valve calcifications. And if EF is below 50%, then a dobutamine stress echo <clears throat> is recommended. And uh, of course, you need to make sure that the aortic valve area doesn't change significantly. And if so, you have severe AS. So <clears throat> here we do not have much change from the previous guidelines. But again, it would be important that these things are performed in a lab with a very good <clears throat> quality and the team that is able to perform these with a good uh, accuracy. And then once you know there is severe uh, aortic stenosis, you have to balance <clears throat> the risk of an early intervention in the case of an asymptomatic patient with the risk of a delayed intervention, each of them having his own features. And in the middle is very important to answer these questions in order to take the decision, which type of intervention do we foresee, which are the predictors of a worse outcome, and most important again, the patient the patient age, comorbidities, general condition, and you put all of that into this uh, uh, thorough evaluation in order to balance and to see whether the, the balance is tipped towards early intervention or towards watchful waiting. Now coming to the indications that are included in the recent EAC, EACDS guidelines, uh, of course, we know that uh, whenever there's a patient who is asymptomatic but has a reduced ejection fraction without an alternative explanation, this is a clear class one indication. And here there are no changes from the previous guidelines. However, it is very important to confirm the asymptomatic status of the patient by performing an exercise test. And sometimes you see that these patients are not really asymptomatic. In fact, 20 to 30% of these patients develop symptoms during exercise testing. So then, of course, they have a clear indication for intervention. But the new thing is here in the threshold of ejection fraction, if you have below 50% the class one indication, now even below 55%, you have an indication for intervention with a lower uh, recommendation level is 2A. But this is important, and this is a novel thing that was included here. Uh, and, and so putting things together, you have the ejection fraction, which now is above 55%. If the patient has an EF above 55 and the normal exercise test, but still procedural risk is low, and you have some markers related with the poor prognosis, like very severe AS, or severe valve calcification, or a rapid severity progression, or markedly elevated BMP levels, more than three times the uh, normal range corrected for age and sex, a number of parameters that could tip the balance towards intervention with a 2A class. And even without uh, being given a class of indication, in the text of the guidelines, you have a number of parameters that are listed here. And obviously, the more parameters from this list you have, uh, you know, the, the higher the likelihood that you would have a choice to, uh, to send the patient for surgery. So in fact, early intervention 
may be considered in these asymptomatic patients if you have one or more of these predictors and if the procedural risk is low. Otherwise, of course, you will wait and you will base a, a, a conservative approach. So again, which are the studies that are based, uh, that, that were at the basis of these changes? We know that 50% is too low. In fact, it is also rare that you have patients with an EF below 50% who are still asymptomatic, just a minority. And secondly, we know from several studies that the prognosis is affected not below 50, but even below 55, you have a clear impact on survival, on overall mortality. So this is an argument that 55 is already too low to wait further. And in terms of very severe AS, we have this randomized trial from Korea that was published in the New England Journal, and they randomized 145 asymptomatic patients to early surgery or conservative care. And if you look at operative mortality or death from cardiovascular causes, you see that at four years, there was 1% with surgery compared to six with conservative care, and also clear difference in terms of uh, follow-up at eight years. So suggesting that early intervention is better than watchful waiting in this group. However, this trial called the recovery trial also has some features that we need to keep in mind. First of all, it included relatively young patients around 63 to 65, with the majority of them having a bicuspid valve. Also, the asymptomatic status was not really confirmed by exercise testing as just a few underwent exercise testing and there was no BNP assessment of risk. Also, the operative mortality was zero in this cohort, <clears throat> which is not really something that we see in many centers in such cohorts. And also more than one third remained asymptomatic without requiring an intervention during four years of follow-up. More recently, and after the publication of the ESC guideline, the AVATAR trial was published in November in circulation, another randomized trial with a similar number of patients, this time only severe AS conventionally defined. In fact, very severe AS were excluded. This time more than 80% have degenerative AS and the minority of less than 15% had the bicuspid valve. Also a bit relatively young compared to what we see in other cohorts, but still they were followed for close to three years as a median follow-up with a composite endpoint. And it was shown that this was better in the early surgery group compared to the conservative treatment. Again, bringing some information that early surgery may be considered in these uh, patients, even if asymptomatic. So basically based on these uh, studies, intervention was uh, recommended as a class 2A in patients with EF above 55 and in patients with very severe AS. And these were changed in terms of cutoff values compared to the previous uh, edition of the guidelines. But I would like to highlight once again that after confirming severe AS, we need to uh, uh, assess the, the asymptomatic status by exercise testing. And we also need to educate the patient to, to, to tell him what are the symptoms that should bring him immediately back to the doctor, uh, because if we wait too much, there is a risk of sudden death uh, while waiting for uh, the routine follow-up. Some newer features that are not included in the guidelines, but uh, there is uh, important data to support its use as an adjunctive measure. For example, not just looking at the ejection fraction, which we know is not the best measure in vulvar heart disease, but looking at myocardial function and structure, for example, global longitudinal strain. This is a meta-analysis showing that this is able to separate prognostically patients, even in those in the group that have a preserved EF above 60%. So this, this could help uh, separating patients who have a higher risk of mortality. And also myocardial fibrosis, is an important pathological feature 
uh, pointing towards LV decompensation in these patients. And there is this interesting study uh, from the United Kingdom showing that um, the presence of late gadolinium enhancement, the mere presence of LGE, uh, correlated with both increase in all cause and cardiovascular mortality, irrespective uh, of the type of intervention or uh, uh, the existence or absence of coronary artery disease. So if you have LGE, you know that this is associated with a higher late mortality after intervention, suggesting that the presence of LGE might be a parameter that might tip the intervention towards an early decision. And there are also several other randomized studies ongoing in asymptomatic severe AS to specifically look at markers like fibrosis by CMR or GLS, as I have explained before, and we are waiting the results of these trials to see whether we can better risk stratify these patients. So um, in conclusion, the guidelines um, have expanding the indications for an earlier intervention if the patients have a low operative risk. And importantly, I think we should highlight that the focus should not only be on the severity of the valve lesion itself, but also looking at its consequences, most importantly, on the left ventricle. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Popescu. Um, I, uh, if you agree, we will um, uh, try to um, answer the questions at the end uh, of uh, all three presentations. So uh, it's my pleasure to give the word to Professor Alec Vanian, uh, which will present uh, to us intervention um, uh, in uh, aortic stenosis. Okay, so Alexander, thank you. Well, uh, I'm going to concentrate this talk on patients with symptoms, the other end of the spectrum, because Bogdan spoke about the asymptomatic. So I have no conflict in this domain. So uh, I just want to re-emphasize the importance of aortic stenosis. And in a recent document from the ESC, you see the increase, a dramatic increase in Professor, the prevalence. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, we do yes. not see your screen. Uh, could you please share your screen? Thank you. Uh, well, I think I am sharing. I'm sorry. Uh, I share again. Sorry. Ah, so I have a problem there. Uh, I have to go and pick it up again. I'm sorry. No problem. Uh, because it was there and it disappeared. So I'll, I'll share. Uh, here it is. Now, I hope, can you see it now? Uh, no, not yet. No, so I, am, I, try, I try to, ah, because I have a problem there, so I try. Ooh, 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 ooh. I do not know what happened because it worked a minute ago. Uh, can you hear me? No. Yes, we can hear you. Oh. Uh, maybe uh, you you might want to close the PowerPoint uh, application. Yes. yes. And then start it once again, and then try um, clicking on the uh, partage d'écran. Uh, yes, but uh, I. I think if you don't mind, maybe you'll go with uh, Stefan and I join okay. again right. because uh, something happened. Huh? Okay. okay, I'm sorry uh, about that. It's happening. No problem. So uh, we will proceed with Professor uh, Stefan Baldus uh, from the Heart Center, uh, University of Cologne, Germany. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Professor Baldus, for your presence today. Uh, Professor Baldus, Baldus will present uh, intervention in mitral leg regurgitation. Thank you so much, um, Professor Michi, for, for inviting me. It's a pleasure for me to do so, and it's a pleasure to me to do this together with Professor Vahanian, who basically chaired, as you all know, uh, these, uh, these guidelines which uh, evoked so many discussions uh, thereafter. So it's a pleasure to talk about interventions in mitral regurgitation. Uh, these are my conflicts of interest. And um, mitral regurgitation from us all was seen as an innocent uh, disease, and we were very surprised to see that irrespective of ejection fraction, 
survival and prognosis of patients with moderate to severe mild regurgitation is markedly impaired. In particular, if you, if you look for longer time points, such as shown here for over 10 years, you see that you overall have a 50% reduced survival uh, over a decade in patients uh, diagnosed for this disease. So it's, it's all but not an innocent uh, benign uh, disease. And what is important as well is that this is irrespective of the etiology of mitral regurgitation. You all know that we basically divide mitral regurgitation in degenerative, in primary mitral regurgitation and secondary mitral regurgitation. What you can see here is that ventricular functional mitral regurgitation as well as atrial mitral regurgitation have indeed the anticipated worst prognosis. However, also degenerative mitral disease is um, associated with, uh, with impaired outcome over the long run. If you look at patients with acute decompensated heart failure, you can see that the prevalence of mitral regurgitation, moderate to severe MR, is up to 50%, in particular in those patients who are at older age. So what do the guidelines say with respect to primary and secondary mitral regurgitation? I just want to focus on secondary mitral regurgitation, but want to give you just a, a glimpse on, um, on what the guidelines basically say to patients with primary mitral regurgitation, in particular in those patients who are asymptomatic. And here the guidelines are very strict and tell us that even if you have only mildly impaired left ventricular function, as illustrated here by an increase in the left ventricular and systolic diameters of 40 as compared to 45 in the last guidelines, you should indeed see an indication for surgical repair in these patients. So patients, even if they are asymptomatic and have mild disease of the ventricles should undergo a very early surgery in order to prevent a reverse um, uh, and adverse remodeling of the ventricle. And this is basically based um, on, uh, on, on larger registries, the MIDA registry is probably the most important one, which basically shows that if you have a ventricle of more than 40 millimeters, uh, the chance of um, adverse outcome in these patients is uh, significantly um, increased. And you see here that other parameters such as age symptoms, atrial fibrillation, and the atrial diameter also uh, come into place and illustrate and indicate which patients are indeed at risk uh, of adverse outcome. That's why they should uh, be treated early on. Now, uh, the reality, however, is that only a fraction of all patients with mitral re regurgitation with mitral disease are operated on. You see that's, uh, um, again, data from the US. You see here that in primary disease, it's at least 30%, but in secondary MR, and this will be the focus in the next slides, uh, the number of patients treated, the percentage of patients treated is, is really, really low. Um, so interventional treatments come into place and you, you all know that we have different CE certified systems available, um, in particular um, leaflet-based therapies such as the MitroClip or the Pascal system. Um, we have indirect annuloplasty devices. We had the direct cardioband annuloplasty device, which is currently not available for the mitral. Um, and here's the tendine prosthesis, which is the first CE certified transapical mitral valve replacement therapy. Now, what is done with these therapies? If you look at Germany, you can see here in blue very easy that over time, uh, in particular in older patients, um, uh, the transcatheter treatment overruns uh, the surgical treatment. And even in patients younger than 75 years of age, it's almost 50% of all patients treated with a single lesion in the mitral valve uh, who are treated transcatheter. Uh, so it's an important uh, technique. And the foundation to do so basically lies on two randomized trials, the mitral FR trial, and the US COAPT trial. And many of you are aware of these of the data um, and um, the, the disappointment we all had in, in the first uh, uh, look at uh, these uh, uh, results from the mitral FR trial, which didn't show a prognostic benefit of these patients. However, as you can see here, at least uh, in the longer run, there was a signal at least towards an improvement in 
uh, a lower need for rehospitalizations for these patients treated with the CLIP. But uh, in this cohort of patients, there was uh, for sure no significant difference in the treatment arms. And this was drastically different uh, if you um, look at the co-opt uh, study, a study which was done with twice as many patients and, um, and uh, will follow, we'll get a follow-up at least as long as the MITRE FR trial. And these patients um, were um, not that sick with respect to the left ventricle, however, had a larger degree of mitral regurgitation. And in these patients treated with the mitral clip, you can see that both mortality was uh, reduced by almost 40%, as was um, heart failure hospitalization reduced by almost 50%. So a pronounced benefit in favor of treatment of the mitral valve, which outcompetes all other uh, singular treatment strategies we uh, witnessed so far in randomized trials. And if you look for longer um, year follow-ups, you see here the three-year outcomes published last year, you basically can see that this persists, this difference in um, benefit um, persists uh, over the, uh, the three years. And you can see here that even heart failure hospitalizations um, are, are reduced further. So a number needed to treat of three to prevent one heart failure hospitalization is really um, a, a massive um, effect. However, the downside of this study is the large number of exclusion and inclusion criteria. So the very selected uh, patient population looked at, um, you can see here that it basically is divided into clinical presentations, left ventricular presentations, and uh, others with respect to the right ventricle and the pulmonary uh, circulation. And um, many trials, many studies have been performed and basically can show that uh, a truncated version of the COAP criteria are um, uh, um, in, in, the, in the situation that they help to indeed identify these patients in a real world scenario. Also, you can see here one of the largest studies which looked at this, which shows that if you have a COAP like profile and uh, undergo a, um, the CLIP therapy, that you indeed have a better, better outcome reduced mortality. So, this is in a way very optimistic. Uh, um, uh, making us. Um, the other aspect is the proportionality or disproportionality of mitral regurgitation. As you uh, can see here, um, we, um, we know that with increasing diameters and volumes of the left ventricle, the extent of the regurgitation orifice area has to increase as well. And if you are above this, you indeed are uh, in the ballpark of the coapt patient, which is a disproportional severe mitral regurgitation, a potential indicator of a prognostic uh, impact on, um, on uh, the treatment itself. Um, however, um, the question is, can we also treat other patients and derive a benefit for them? And this is a subgroup of the COAP trial, very interesting study, as I think, where they compared uh, the mitra fr like subgroup in COAP with uh, the rest of COAPT. And you can see here that there was only an, uh, a, a small indication that indeed uh, TER, so, so leaflet therapy indeed is doing something, but this was not significant. However, if you look at the functional outcome of these patients, improvement in symptoms and improvement in six minute walk distance, you can see that these patients indeed do derive a benefit from this therapy. Perhaps they have no prognostic implication, but they have a benefit with respect to quality of life, an important aspect in this therapy um, for sure. We know that we have to be good in doing this. Uh, that's why we need these centers. So the degree of mitral regurgitation at discharge is a prognosticator, as is the development and uh, reoccurrence of mitral regurgitation between discharge and 12 months. Patients who remain with very low degree of mitral regurgitation uh, do better than others who develop mitral regurgitation. And here are uh, the final recommendations for the guidelines, which say that indeed in patients who fulfill these criteria, which I just pointed out, um, mitral clip therapy is no longer a 2B, but should be considered as a 2A indication for these, for these uh, patients. What do we have uh, in place and what is the future? Potentially, 
transapical mitral valve replacement, the 10-9 prosthesis is the only one uh, available currently, but uh, as you can see here, it's very effective in reducing mitral regurgitation and is, um, is, uh, is also safe in very selected patients. We have to see what, uh, what else is coming with respect to transvenous catheter systems for replacement therapy. And just uh, to summarize this, um, I think interventional therapy um, and the treatment of mitral regurgitation has a, a very important focus in the current guidelines. Uh, the guidelines say that in primary mitral regurgitation, um, this therapy is reserved for patients at high risk or inoperable patients. And the guidelines also make, uh, make clear that early surgery in asymptomatic patients at low risk is something which we have to uh, consider very firmly. In secondary mitral regurgitation, we have a profound benefit and a mortality benefit in selected patients. We can reduce hospitalization to almost 50% with this uh, therapy. And we know that um, there are certain predictors, um, LV dysfunction, right heart disease, or the disproportional mitral regurgitation, which help us to define patients who derive this prognostic benefit from this therapy also. And uh, with this, I'd like to thank you for your attendance. Thank you very much, Professor Baldus, for this excellent presentation. Uh, and now my pleasure to invite Professor Vahanian to give us his talk on intervention in aortic stenosis. I try again, I try again. Yes, here it is. <laughs> here it is. Okay. So now I think I have to rush a little bit. The title, you know, the conflict, you know, the importance of the topic, you know. And here is a group of people who are involved in the guideline. And uh, of course, uh, Professor Baldus was there and uh, um, a friend of Popescu was not far. So you see surgeons and cardiologists trying to write together. Well, the point is, if we look at what was the evidence and what uh, the guidelines said, uh, in 2017, we wrote guidelines pretty consistent with the American guideline, but uh, colleagues from the US in 2020 wrote guidelines, and uh, these guidelines were written after the publication on low risk, so we are clearly missing uh, data on low risk patient in our European guidelines. So these two trials, um, the partner three and the evolute uh, low risk patient, you know them, you heard a lot, they were published in New England Journal of Medicine, and they are a population which is somewhat different from the population we are used to see in TAVI, uh, because the um, surgical risk used in the STS was relatively low, below 2%, and these patients were significantly younger than in the previous trial, and you see that both trials were pretty consistent to show either superiority or non-inferiority uh, for in favor of TAVI. Well, uh, our colleagues from Bern uh, did immediately a meta-analysis, which is also very interesting, putting all the trials together and concluding that TAVI provides a 12% reduction of mortality uh, in comparison with surgery after two years follow-up. And especially if you use a transfemoral route, the benefit is great, 17% mortality reduction. So that's very clear. Of course, these two low-risk patients were not all commerce. And in this trial, patients with low flow aortic stenosis were excluded, as well as patients with bicuspid valve, those with multiple valve disease, those with severe coronary disease, and the high-risk TAVI anatomy and high-risk surgery patients. So it's very selected population of patients. But now we, do, now we do agree that TAVI has several advantages which speak highly to the patient. The procedure is less invasive, very important for the patient. No bypass, that's very important also. 
Definitely there is a lower mortality when using transfemoral approach. Lower risk of stroke, the slide was, was written before. Lower risk of AFib, bleeding, kidney injury. That's not made minor issue. And the outcome was great in terms of shorter hospitalization, faster recovery, improved quality of life, which is of utmost importance for a patient. Long term, well, we know that valve in valve is feasible. We know that with this prosthesis, you don't need long term anticoagulation. But the open question is about durability. Well, durability here we plotted, it is Elena Chanina from Rouen, who plotted all the so called long term data we have, and they go to seven, eight years, but growths are pretty reassuring because they show a low incidence of structural valve disease and low incidence of reoperation. In a Canadian registry from John Webb, also data were even up to 10 years and went the same way with a low rate of structural dysfunction. And the randomized trial notion, which was not available when we presented the guideline, goes up to eight years comparing patients with TAVI versus patients with surgical AVR, and you see that the outcomes are grossly superimposable after eight years, also as regards the rate of valve failure. So this is very reassuring in favor of TAVI. But clearly this slide from the last undergrad is, is a very nice one, and we have to plot the durability of the transcatheter valve versus patient life expectancy. If the life, the TAVI durability is questionable after 10 years, which is the case now, there is really no problem to put this valve in an 80 year old gentleman who has a somewhat limited life expectancy. But when the patient is much younger, has a long life expectancy, we have questions and we should consider a lifelong strategy. And of course, there are other um, open questions as regards TAVI. The data are accumulating on bicuspid, but this patient has to be evaluated in a randomized trial. We do not know very well about the consequences on outcome of having a left bundle branch block after the procedure. We know that it's not very good to have a pacemaker, especially if you are a young person. We need more data on the concomitant coronary artery disease uh, with a question mark of the future coronary access, even if many refinements are present now. So I come back to this slide, and um, Bogdan showed you uh, initially it is a central figure of the guide. In the first line, you see that this evaluation should be patient centered. It means several things. It means that we should consider patient first and not operate because we are a surgeon and do TAVI because we are interventionist. We should choose what is best for the patient. Then uh, this evaluation before intervention should be finalized in a hard valve center. That is to say a center of excellence in the treatment of valve disease. And it is clearly stated in the document with uh, several details that these hard valve centers should declare their local expertise, but also show it on their outcomes. And there is a relationship between volume and outcomes. Even if the curves are not parallel, there is a relationship. And this uh, hard valve center should have both cardiology and cardiac surgical programs on seat, and this group should collaborate. Well, then we'll have to go through a series of steps. We should know, and Bogdan already touched that, if the symptoms are there, and if there are symptoms in this relatively elderly population, we should know if the symptoms are due to the valve disease and not to another cause. Then we should look at the valve using Professor Carpentier's triad. We should know from ECHO what is the etiology, what are the lesions, and what are the mechanisms 
Here, echo is a key player. Assessment of the severity, once again, echo is key, but CT is a very important adjunct. And I won't insist because Bogdan nicely showed you that we have to go stepwise and make a sort of expert evaluation before saying it's a severe heart external disease or it is not. Then we have to come back to clinic and uh, estimate what is the life expectancy and the expected quality of life. Of course, it's so difficult to know the life expectancy in front of a given patient. And we use as a surrogate age, knowing that it's not perfect. And we have to evaluate very carefully the comorbidities of the patient. And in the guidelines, you have this sort of table showing that evaluating these comorbidities, you can use scores, but you should also look at frailty and frailty indices that are provided in the guidelines and also look at the other organs. And if on the right, you have high risk score, you have several indices of frailty and several organ system failure, it's a problem. The patient won't derive benefit from any intervention. Then you continue your heart team evaluation and you should know what is available for you in the place where you are. And here I must say that there is a discrepancy uh, in, within Europe. And you see, for example, uh, according to gross national income per capita and the number of TAVI which are performed, I'm sorry, which are performed, uh, there is a difference between Germany and Switzerland, where over 200 TAVI per million inhabitants are Form the UK, where the figure is only 50, and Romania, where it is much less. So there is a gradient. Then we have, of course, to evaluate what is the balance between doing an intervention and leaving the patient alone if he has too many comorbidities. And we have to evaluate the treatment options on all what was written before, but also taking into account individual anatomical and procedural factors. And our guideline listed what the heart team should look at. So I won't go into detail, but the heart team should look at clinical characteristics, and some of them will favor TAVI. Others will favor surgery. You should also look at these anatomical and procedural factors. That's very important. And finally, look at the concomitant cardiac conditions requiring intervention. So one of these slides doesn't make the game by itself, but it is a very thorough analysis of all these factors will help the heart team to decide for the best possible approach for the given patient. And that's what you are going to tell to your patient who's going to analyze it according to his own values and expectation that the way to reach the best possible heart team decision. Now we should go to the recommendation in symptomatic patients. You saw the first line that intervention is clearly recommended in patient with symptoms and severe artic stenosis. Intervention is also recommended in symptomatic patients with severe low flow, low gradient artic stenosis with reduced ejection fraction and evidence of flow reserve that definitely derive a lot of benefit. We were more cautious in the group of patients who are symptomatic with low flow, low gradient, but preserved ejection fraction, because here you need more data and we have to take very careful confirmation of the degree of severity of aortic stenosis if we want to avoid doing TAVI to patients without severe aortic stenosis, but only hypertension. Intervention should also be considered in symptomatic patients with low flow, low gradient, severe aortic stenosis and reduced ejection fraction without contractile reserve, flow reserve, especially if there is a lot of calcium on CT because this patient 
also derive benefit from intervention in comparison with medical treatment. And finally, very importantly, intervention is not recommended, should not be performed in patients with too many comorbidities where intervention is unlikely to prolong or to improve the quality of life. Now, the hot point is to choose the mode of intervention in aortic stenosis, at least where TAVI is available. And we wrote this recommendation, which surpasses all the others, which is the most important one. The choice between surgery and transcatheter intervention must be based on careful evaluation of clinical, anatomical, procedural factor by the heart team, weighing the risk and benefit for the given patient, and importantly, this was added to the new guidelines, the heart team recommendation should be discussed with the patient who then is going to take an informed decision. So we propose as illustration, taking into account the big challenge of durability, that surgery is recommended in younger patients who are at low risk for surgery, and we propose this 75 years threshold, or the surgery is probably the treatment of choice in patients who are operable but unsuitable for transfemoral TAVI. Then, on the other end of the spectrum, in the patients who are older or those who are high risk or inoperable, well, TAVI is the way to go. And in the middle, you have many patients, and the only way to choose is to look one by one to each of the characteristics. And here is the goal, the work of the heart team. We put a recommendation on non-transfemoral TAVI, which may be considered in patients who are inoperable and unsuitable for transfemoral TAVI. And finally, balloon valvuloplasty has a very limited role only in hemodynamic unstable patients or before major non-cardiac surgery, urgent non-cardiac surgery. So uh, we ended up with this diagram, which was shown by my friend Bogdan, and everything was already said. We have three groups, yes for surgery, yes for TAVI, in the middle, individualization of the decision. I'd like to say that in the US guidelines, our colleague grossly used the same mechanism for patient high or prohibitive risk, TAVI or nothing, for the authors, well, they choose to select the age or for intervention according to the age for bioprosthesis or mechanical valve. This can be debated, and uh, they ended up in the bottom part in patients below 65, they go to surgery, over 80, they go to TAVI, and in the middle, it's really an individualization one by one. Our colleagues from Germany, and Stefan can discuss that, uh, wrote a paper which uh, was uh, published before the guidelines, showing also that in low risk patients below 70, surgery is probably the best way to go. In patients over 75, TAVI is recommended, and in between, well, individual decision. Why did I show you all these uh, three slides? to say that growth is a spirit is the same, should be multifactorial approach. The age slightly varies, and if the age varies between guidelines, it means that we do not have solid evidence to say one threshold of age over the other. And finally, just a word to say that there are great hope because a very nice and reassuring publication on uh, transcatheter valve in a valve in case of dysfunction of um, bioprosthesis, surgical implanted bioprosthesis, or even now in TAVI, in TAVI. And this led to upgrade the level of evidence in patients who are high risk or inoperable. So before concluding, I'd like to encourage you to have a look at the preamble of the guidelines. Because guidelines are only guidelines, they are not the Bible. And they are here to support you, to help you when exercising your clinical judgment. And it's extremely important to plot, to put together something you 
know about your patient, it is the individual health condition which cannot summarize in the guidelines. And the conclusion, the take-home message is that surgery and TAV are definitely complementary treatment options for aortic stenosis. And here is a diagram recently published from France, that the same data in Germany, same data in the US, showing that the TAV in red goes up. That's very, very good. We have more TAV performed than surgery, but the best news is that the number of patients who receive any intervention almost doubled between 209 and now. That's a very good news for a patient. More patients are treated. And the choice between one approach or the other must be based on the heart team evaluation for all, all patients. And the heart team recommendation should be discussed with a patient who can take this very important informed treatment choice. So thank you for attention, merci. Thank you very much, Alec. Great talk as usual. We have a number of questions. I think we have at least 10 minutes to discuss. And if I may just start, I think there were two questions on this topic. What about combined non-severe valve disease, whether we have moderate AS plus moderate AR, for example, this is one. And on the same line of thinking, if we have just moderate AS with reduced ejection fraction with LV dysfunction. Okay, the second one is easiest. <laughs> well, in point of fact, we don't know. We don't know, but there are trials ongoing. I yeah. hope that this trial will end up one day. Not because I'm in the DSMB, but because it's an important question, but it stressed the fact that we have to look very carefully to the degree of severity of the patient. Because patients with moderate AS, have usually a poor outcome, but they die from other diseases, other cardiac or non-cardiac disease. So it's very important to know if the fact we do something on, if we fix the valve, is the way to go. So this will come, the unload trial will come hopefully in the coming year. The other question it relates to mixed aortic valve disease. I think here we need the good judgment, the good clinical judgment. And what we have to look at is if the patient is symptomatic, if there is no other reason than the aortic valve disease, you should go and treat this uh, valve disease. If there are other reasons, well, um, you should think about it and you should look at the consequences on the valve disease on the left ventricular dilatation, function, also on the pulmonary pressure. So you make a reasoning on the distal, let's say the consequences, and that's the way to go. There are patients treated with TAVI, of course, with both. Absolutely agree. Uh, there is another question, perhaps for Professor Baldus. Mitral regurgitation, LBBB with LV dysfunction. Should we start with CRT or mitral clip? That's a great question, and uh, as... Uh, Alec just mentioned, even for this uh, topic, we do not have the randomized trial. So I, I, I don't know yet. But what, what we know is that we have a class one indication for treating patients with depressed LV function, EF below 35, and an LBB uh, of 140, um, uh, or even better, higher with CRT first, and then you would you would see whether you have uh, resolution of mitral regurgitation. If you don't have, there are good data showing that these patients who have relevant, significant mitral regurgitation past CRT treatment are also patients who should undergo treatment of mitral regurgitation. And also, I think also in coaps everything was optimized, including CRT before undergoing mitral clip. That's true, it's, it's CRT, but perhaps even more important, it was time which was given to the patient and it was medical therapy, therapy which was optimized in these patients. And if you have severity of mitral regurgitation on top of, of optimization of uh, heart failure therapy, then you should consider treatment of the valve itself. Yeah, careful selection. Okay. 
I don't know, maybe Alex or Alex. I have a question for you, my dear Bogdan. Now you must work. Huh? No, I think you, you made a very comprehensive presentation and we understood where we are. But uh, do, you agree, do you agree that we should stress the fact that this very early indication for intervention should happen only in patients at low risk? Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. I mean, every decision is based on a balance of risk and benefits. So of course, if you have zero operative mortality, this is difficult to beat, but it's unlikely in common day scenario. So you, you need to, I think you made the right point to, to say that you need also to look in your own institution. I mean, we talk about guidelines and you need to know what your performances are where you work and then really put this into perspective. But obviously, very early intervention only in low risk patients for the moment, at least, I think. Yeah. And I have another question for you, uh, Bogdan. Well, don't you think that, uh, well, I do agree with you that strain is extremely important. All these new tests uh, like fibrosis are extremely important, but why don't we start by exercising the patient? I mean, exercising more. Absolutely. No, I think, and also, I mean, we wait for the results of the trial. There is also a question of availability. I mean, even LGE is very appealing, very intellectual, very nice. But then, I mean, probably not so easy to do it at a large scale. However, exercise is something that we should definitely perform in everyone to make sure that they are truly asymptomatic. Because as I said, a large, significant proportion uh, turn out to be actually symptomatic and then they have a clear indication. Mm -hmm. Well, we have a question, i uh, finish with you. Uh, we have a question from for you uh, from the audience. A colleague uh, said, well, if everything is negative, but the patient has very, very severe AS, is asymptomatic, should we push him to surgery? Or to, yeah, to surgery? Very severe AS, still very severe. asymptomatic. Yes, I think here we have data, it's it's, currently a class 2A indication. But again, I think uh, we should carefully look at, so probably in such a case, you should go for intervention if you really have that is critical AS and you have a good, a good team to, uh, to make the intervention. Okay, so Stefan, I guess you agree with that? Exactly, you have to have a, a very good surgeon to do so, so, so that you reflect the almost 0% mortality in the two trials we, we, was, we were witnessing. Um, uh, and, and, and yes, and as, as, as you, Alec, pointed out, we do not have the trial data yet for the asymptomatic patient who receives a transcatheter valve. And now if we move to your mitral aspect, Stefan, <laughs> a colleague asked if you can give us uh, some, some data or your thoughts about long-term durability of the transcatheter uh, interventions in mitral regurg. Well, what we, what we for sure know is uh, the, the COAP data over three years. We, we know the Everest data over five years and a little bit... Uh, beyond that, and they are looking very promising. However, we have to, um, to see that um, um, the disease in a patient with functional mitral regurgitation is not the valve, but it's the ventricle. So we have to obviously help these patients in adjunct to treating the mitral valve with an optimal medical or device-based therapy. So if you do not do this, progression of disease will also lead to reoccurrence of mitral regurgitation, uh, and, and, and that's something to consider. Okay, and another question for you, Stefan. Well, you are an expert in the field. We speak a lot about providing treatment for the mitral valve in this patient, but can you summarize very briefly about the importance of looking at the tricuspid and trying to tackle it when possible? Yeah, I think the, the field of tricuspid repair is as important as for mitral repair. And, and you were the first to include this into a guideline, Alec, uh, yeah. which is, I think, we <laughs> which is, I think, extremely important. And I think what we see with respect to potential prognostic implications of transcatheter therapies is very promising. We are awaiting randomized trials, lots of randomized trials, which will show whether we indeed also can reduce mortality. What we know is 
that we improve symptoms of these patients. What you have to do first is treat the left heart. So treat aortic stenosis or treat mitral regurgitation, and then carefully observe these patients with respect to severity of tricuspid regurgitation, and then make a judgment whether this uh, lesion has to be treated as well. Good. So Bogdan, any other question? So I would have a question for Professor Alian. Um, can you please uh, detail a little, a little bit about TAVI in aortic stenosis um, with bi bicuspid valves? Well, you know, uh, as I said, we do not have randomized evidence. But now we experience in uh, patient screening and Stefan can probably say more than I, with experience in screening, a bicuspid is not a bicuspid. And you have to differentiate the patient who could be a good candidate, that is to say effective result with uh, no major paravalvular leak, et cetera, from the others. Also, in patients with bicuspid, you should not only look at the valve, but look at the ascending aorta because it could be, um, there could be a need for an uh, intervention, a simultaneous intervention on the ascending aorta. So it's very, very important to have this look. And then uh, there are also progress in the devices. And now we have devices which are better suited for this bicuspid patient than the other. And at the end of it, as I just said, we need uh, more data. So maybe, Stefan, you want to add something? No, I think this is, as, as you said, it's, ex it's extremely important to make the diagnosis prior and during screening of these patients. You have to look at the aorta as well, and then you have to decide whether this patient is a good patient to get conventional surgery or whether you should go for transcatheter repair, mm -hmm. and then you should indeed uh, choose the right valve to treat him. But is this, as, as Alec pointed out, this is not a cohort of patients which has, which has been included into randomized trials. So it has to be very carefully looked at these patients. But uh, Alexander, I think it's a very common situation in Asia, uh, in China, for example. And uh, when we go down in age, it will become a real issue. But fortunately, there are many people working on it and will have probably good answers. Thank you so much. So um, one, uh, one or two uh, final questions. Uh, what about um, uh, the use of NOAX of new anticoagulants in patients with surgical or transcatheter bioprosthesis in the first uh, three months after implantation? Uh, Professor Popescu, what do you think? It's <laughs> not an easy question. I'm sorry for that. Good luck, Bogdan. Good luck. <laughs> No, I, I think also the guideline make the point that <clears throat> we can expand a little bit the use of, of NOAX, first of all, uh, in general, because it was thought that it's uh, it's uh, indicated just in non-valvular in non uh, AF, but then, of course, by looking at uh, subgroups from the four big trials, now actually we have a clear indication to be used in preference to VKA, in all types of valve disease, except of course for mitral stenosis, uh, and and then um, uh, in patients who do not have AF, uh, we cannot hear you. Look then, the internet is a little slow. Um, Maybe Professor Popescu will, will come back uh, as soon as possible. Well, no, uh, if I may, uh, I think I completely share what Bogdan said. Uh, when we published uh, the guidelines, we had only one uh, trial which was uh, negative, uh, but uh, another one came just during the ESC, which was not that positive. And we are still, uh, as far as I know, uh, waiting for. Uh, the results of the French trial, which hopefully will, will come very soon. Uh, but in practice, uh, I don't know the situation in Germany, Stefan, but many groups, many people, when they receive a patient under NOAX uh, because of AFib, uh, they do the TAVI and continue with NOAX. 
in practice. Is it also your practice, Stefan? Yes, yes, it is. I, I would be a little bit conservative with respect to rivaroxaban, a little yeah. bit conservative with respect to edoxaban, but mm. with respect to apixaban, we have at least signals that you can do this, and that's uh, what, what we would suggest. Yeah. But we, we have to look at the data and try to merge the data, but one NOAC is not another one. So I do agree with Stefan, we have to be a bit more specific. Thank you, Professor Popescu is back. Uh, so but disconnected. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Uh, so uh, Professor Vanyan and Baldus completed your, your response. Uh, two last questions. Professor Popescu, would you think that there are still important differences um, uh, in the European versus the uh, American guidelines? And this is addressed to all the speakers, in fact. And uh, uh, maybe the last questions uh, the last question, um, would you address, please, uh, um, so in, in the guideline, um, you, you found that um, maybe there uh, is a need for advocacy of valvular heart disease. How would you uh, uh, detail on that, please? Maybe, Alec, you would like to go for the, I don't think there are major differences, and you highlighted already. Some of the, well, the I think, I must say, I think there is too much emphasis on the very tiny differences and not enough on the very large agreement between the two documents. And that's the, the final message. These documents are very, very consistent. If there is a difference on the age limit between TAVI in one group and the other one, it means we don't know. It means the heart team should play its role, take into account all the old information, speak to the patient, and you'll end up by the best possible decision. So that's my, my point for MR. There is no real, real discrepancy. And TR, I think we are a little bit in advance, and NOAC, we are grossly on the same line. And the patient evaluation, we're on the same line. Patient centered, patient centered, need for heart valve center. If you agree, Stefan, I think mostly good um, concordance. I agree. Okay. And the other one, what was the last one? I'm sorry. So uh, the last one addressed to all of you, Professor Baldus. Maybe uh, you should um, you should tell me what you think. Um, you use you, you all of you all the all the authors of the guideline uh, stated that there is a, maybe a lack of advocacy regarding valvular heart disease, Professor Baldus. How would you think to address that? How would you address that in our usual practice? Well, um, it's it's not obviously it's a challenge. It's not that that easy. Um, uh, in particular, if you do this in Germany in front of the politicians who say you are implanting too many transcatheter valves, why why do you want to make this this field even larger? But I think the problem is somewhere else, and and we should make clear that the malignancy of the disease, that the poor prognosis of patients with valvular disease is at least as bad as for many patients who have uh, cancers. And this is what we have to make clear to, sh to show that uh, the number one reason for mortality uh, is, needs to be better diagnosed and that the treatment is, is something which comes thereafter. And, and that's what we should in, in, in Europe, across Europe should try to improve, I guess. Uh, no, I do strongly support what Stefan says, because if you want to apply the patient-centered and give the informed choice to the patient, the patient should be educated. And Bogdan uh, said that very nicely. I think it's very important. You cannot share with an uneducated, uh, brainless uh, person with Alzheimer, etc. But the others, we should do our best. And there are valve days, you know, in Canada, in the US, in the UK, they are very, very much in advance. And I think we should follow their example for once. No, that's very important. And for Bogdan also, if we do not, the patient do not come to us, how yeah. can we treat them? No, absolutely. Uh, I'm afraid we need to close the webinar here. I think it was a very nice meeting and uh, I would like to thank uh, all of you for the participation and maybe have the final word to Alec and to Alex. Thanks a lot.
Okay, well, my, my final word will be thank you and sorry for <laughs> my little technical issue, but I'm too old, you know, for these sort of games with computer. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much to all of you. Thank you, Professor Vanyan. Thank you, Professor Baldus. Thank you, Professor Popescu. We appreciate enormously your, your time. We know we are, you are extremely busy and we hope to see you again uh, uh, at our webinar. Uh, we had um, um, at least uh, 1,000 um, uh, subscribers with uh, uh, 200 uh, live audience. So this is a huge success. Uh, that means that people are very interested um, in, uh, in, uh, in this domain. Um, and thank you once again for your uh, participation and thank you for the audience participation also. Have a very nice evening and take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Thank you.